Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. All right, so uh, I've got another set of wines to do here. In the next like couple few more episodes, it's going to be all these samples I got from uh, my good friends at Creative Palette. Thank you so much, ladies, for sending me some really cool wines. So, you recognize these? You should, if you've been watching my, my uh, show for at least since last March. So, last year, I went to Provine in March, and I interviewed Alessandro uh, Pasqua, and I also got to meet his uh, his brother and the father too. Yeah. Um, so at dinner, and I actually met the brother also during the interview. But I interviewed Alessandro at their booth, and it was an awesome interview. And these were some wines that we had tried. And this is a really cool story about a uh, really cool thing about these wines. So let me um, let me go through and kind of talk about these wines as a category, and then we'll get into each wine on its own. So they're both called uh, Romeo and Juliet uh, Passione Sentimento, right? And it's kind of hard to see it, but uh, also the story is that this is like the, uh, the graffiti on the wall where uh, I think Juliet's house for Romeo and Juliet in, you know, in Veneto. And um, so uh, that's kind of what they did with this. That's why it's called Romeo and Juliet and there's passion and all that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a production method to make Amarone and or other wines from Veneto called appassimento, which means um, you're gonna you're gonna well you're gonna pass it again, but you have to hand harvest the grapes and the grapes need to be dried out. So when you do amarone, um, well repasso is repassing. Appassimento is drying out, uh, or they they dry it out. So when you make amarone, um, you're drying the grapes out for about three months and they lose about sixty percent of their volume. These wines are effectively less expensive versions. I mean, there isn't really white Amarone, but um, less expensive versions of that, they lose about 30% of their volume instead of 60%. So they're not dried, well, let's say 15 to 30% of the volume. Um, so they don't dry at dry out as much or lose as much volume. So it's not as, ex, expensive, as expensive to produce these wines. So these wines uh, both retail, suggest so retail price for $16 versus like 40, 50, 60 plus for Amarone, right? Um, now you can get Rapasso wine uh, and Valpolicella and that type of stuff for, you know, 20 plus, well, you could probably get, you can get Valpo for this price. Um, Rapasso, yeah, you can get Rapasso, it's like 15, 16 bucks too, but they also can go up higher. But uh, I remember liking these wines a lot. So let's go into the white first. So, uh, this one is a 100% uh, Garganega, which, you know, I don't do a lot of Garganega, um, but that's a native variety to Italy, 100%. And um, looking at the text sheet, it looks like there might be a little bit of a uh, little sweetness to it. Um, there's 9.5 grams per liter of, of residual sugar, so there might be a touch of sweetness. I don't remember that, but then, then again, I've also had probably 200 wines since there, um, and I had a bunch of wines in the booth. So I'm excited to try this again. So uh, it says that they are um, they are harvested. Um, see the Garganega, the the Garganega grapes are harvested in advanced, left to dry in trays for a short time. I'm not sure what that means, but they're left to dry in trays. While drying, the grapes grapes lose lose weight, concentrating sugar and aromas. I mean, there's a that's why there's a higher sugar content. Um, they are left to macerate for 12 hours. Let's, uh, got a clean glass in here because I'll be doing more whites and reds at the same time. Um, and then uh, there is vinified in steel tanks. Then after fermentation, the part of the wine is matured in wooden barrels for some months. And then the wine is blended and bottled. 
All righty. Uh, yeah, and that's that's it for that. Boom. So let's check it out. Like I said, it's about 16 bucks on the suggested retail. So on the palette, it's not super aromatic. Um, it's kind of like a little bit of floral, a little bit of like peach, like white peach. Some apple, let's do a little swirl. Maybe we can get some more out of it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, all that stuff was in hand. So a little bit of white flower, a little white peach, a little apple, like red apple, green apple. Cantaloupe, cantaloupe rind. All right, so let's taste it. Hmm. Okay, so I know there's 9.5 grams per liter of sugar in this wine, but it doesn't taste sweet. Matter of fact, it kind of has like a sweet tart thing going on here. The acid is really high. Now the text sheet says, a text sheet goes by um, grams per liter. Oh no, it has both. So pH is 3.35. That is a higher acid wine. This is definitely an elevated acid wine. pH is a logarithmic scale. So your average wine of a medium acid is around that 3.65. So you're three steps down, which is you know, each tenth is another like logarithmic, like is another like level, order of magnitude. So it's not, so yeah, each tenth is like another order of magnitude. So we're like three orders of magnitude higher or around that. I don't remember the exact mathematical equivalent, but there's definitely some, you know, it's definitely a fairly high acid wine. You know, when you start to get into like Rieslings and Sauvignon Blancs, you start getting into 3.2, 3.1, 3.0, 2.9. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the red was 3.35. 3.1. That makes more sense. Yeah. That makes way more sense. The red is a little bit higher acid. 3.35. 3.1. Yeah. That makes more sense. I'm like, this is almost like Riesling quality. All right, so with all that said, you know, I have that kind of a sweet tart thing going on with the fruits. Um, peach orange, for sure. Like you got that kind of orange, almost like almost like an orange candy thing. Um, you've got peach, orange, apple. Um, there's also like this other aroma I'm getting. It's kind of hard for me to describe. It's like a, it's like a pasta water. Yeah, it's like pasta water. It's kind of weird. Yeah. I'm not sure where that's coming from, but everything else is like really fruit driven. But it's like that kind of a tart bit of fruit. Actually, it could be just the air in the in the house. Just it just all of a sudden there was like this aroma that just came came out of nowhere, and because um, I don't think it's the wine because the wine's flavors don't have that at all. So I don't know. Maybe the air conditioner turned on or something. I I don't know. But the wine smells great and it tastes great too. It's somewhat Sauvignon Blanc like, but you don't get like that grassy and the passion fruit and the grapefruit on it. It's somewhat fuller body Pinot Grigio like. Um, I mean, this is, this is the type of Italian white wine I want to drink. There's nothing wrong with Pinot Grigio at all. I just feel that like Pinot Grigio tends to be such a neutral wine that it gets kind of lost and it's, best if it's ice cold 
So now realize this is room temperature. So I'm, I'm drinking this room temperature. Um, so which is, you know, I, for a while I was kind of leaving the, leaving the wines in the cooler in the cellar for a little bit. So they're like that 50 ish degrees or whatever. And I'd pull them out and they kind of start warming up, but it's better to evaluate these wines at, at room temperature because everything comes through good and bad. And there's nothing but good on this. I'm liking this a lot. If you see this out in the market, you should get it. All right. So uh, moving on. So the 2017 uh, Romeo and Juliet Passione Sentimento uh, Rosso. So what has this got all up in here? So the grape uh, makeup is 40% Merlot, 30% Corvina, and 30% Croatina. Oh, that was... A rough cork to get into. This one has 10 grams per liter sugar and is a 3.35 pH. So slightly less added acid, but a little bit higher on the sugar content. So this is, you could kind of call it a baby Amarone, right? That's what a, that's what a Valpolicello Reposso is. It's like a baby Amarone. And like, so you can get some Reposso's for like 20 ish. Sometimes you can get them for like less. Man, that cork this is not, happy about getting punctured anyway um and some of the other uh things about it so they the merlot and corvina grapes are selected and hand harvested with great care then they are left to dry for one month in wooden trays in the frutaya which i'm assuming is the drying room i've never seen the term before maybe alessandro talked about it i you know last year um so they lose about 30% of their water content and gain high sugar concentration. Uh, then the vinification, vinification process takes place in separate steel tanks uh, for like 20 days. And then maturation is in large cherry barrels uh, that are second use for three months. And then afterwards, they are blended, malolactic happens, and then they you know harmonize and all that. So let's get into this wine. 16 bucks also. And this is this this is what I like about Italian wine. I mean, I don't drink enough Italian wine. And you know, I, I've said this a few times here and there that if you had to make me choose one wine, not one singular wine, and not necessarily one area, but one wine to drink, um, I usually I. I cop out and say old world and they kind of look at me and like okay like france or italy and they look at me again i go okay italy and then they look at me again i'm like hey man like now it's like choosing your favorite child because i love amarone i love uh like a Rapasso style this type of style wine valpolicello is good but sometimes a little light you know i like good chianti i like brunello a light you know a lot um barolo barbaresco you know, they're good. They're kind of sometimes a little more tannic, so you got to let them sit for a while. But if you get like just great straight Nebbiolo from Lange, that's some good stuff. Or just any other any other Nebbiolo appellation from Piedmont. And then you go to Southern Italy and you hit the Alianicos. Then you go to Sicily and you do like freaking uh, Nerodavolas or you go to Cananao from Sardinia. Uh, you, you, go over to, you go over to Apulia and you do... Um, Montepulciano da Bruzzo's, I mean, or Primitivo's, I mean, Zinfandel, basically. Um, man, it's just so much cool stuff from Italy. But with that said, uh, we got some really earthy components to this, some bramble, some really black and red fruits. I mean, this is this is only a this is only a 17, so it's not quite three years, but there's this um there's this like somewhat oxidized look to the wine not quite not the orange hasn't hit it hasn't hit it yet but there's like this kind of um slight cherry looking color to it like like a you know a lighter a lighter purple garnet type of thing anyway 
there's cedar box, there's potpourri, there's cigar box, really. Black fruit, black tea. It's almost like an iced tea. Or like black tea that, you know, is not hot anymore. Yeah, let's get that where you can see it now. Yeah, there we go. Side note, I'm really digging using the phone as my main camera. Matter of fact, um, behind the scenes, last week's behind the scenes, or two weeks ago, three weeks, I don't know. A few weeks ago behind the scenes, it's all about using the iPhone 11 or just an iPhone or smartphone in general as your main camera. Because I have my iPad here as my monitor, and I just, I just, granted, I'm shooting in 4K, and this all gets um, downscaled or down, not downgraded, but like downscaled to 1080p because who's watching stuff, my stuff on 4K? Nobody is. And it doesn't matter about 4K in this type of situation. Anyway, let's just drink this wine. Okay, so we have an elevated residual sugar, but you have elevated acidity. Not as high as this one, but it doesn't taste sweet, okay? Like if the acid was in the normal range, like I already mentioned earlier around here, that 365, 35 to 36, 365, um, then it would taste sweet. Not super sweet, but it would have a little bit of sweet. It's like a semi-sweet or a demi-sec or whatever. But it's just it's just like really good fruit, but there's like a it's like on the edge of tartness. So when you taste the wine, there's this slight bit of tart cherry, tart blackberry. Um, you also get some like in the potpourri's there, but you also get maybe a little more fresher on the violet. Um, there's a bitterness to it, like not like a coffee. But there's like a like a touch of bitterness to it, like a bramble or or like bark. There's almost like a tar to it, which I associate tar with more things like uh, Tuscany rather than Veneto, but. There's a lushness of the fruit and up front, and then it just dries out. So that's one of the tricks that, um, um, oh, what's his name? He's a master of wine from England. He wrote a book about tasting, and Daniel, not Daniel Jackson, that's Stargate. Um, <laughs> actually, that might be his name. Ah, uh, dang it. I'm going to have to look it up. Um, anyway, uh, he talks about how the difference between old world and new world, as a general rule, you can find examples that are that break the trend and all that. But um, as a general rule, it will an old world wine will start sweet or ripe and finish dry. Let's see if it has my Kindle orders. Here we go. Nick Jackson. Not Daniel Jackson. Yeah, Nick Jackson, um, who I got to meet, and he was really cool. It's called Beyond Flavor. You should try it. If, you, if you're into doing wine tasting, uh, especially if you're going to the Master of Wine program, it, it helps with the Master of Psalm program, the court, but either one, it help, definitely helps with the uh, structure more than anything else. Yeah, there's, there's really kind of an orange browning to this. Like, So Italian wines oxidize so fast. Like, they show oxidation really, really fast. Like, whenever we're doing blind tasting and they're pouring the wines and you see, like, orange, you're like, Italy. Or Rioja. Because Rioja tends to have automatically, almost always, when we're doing blind tasting, at least, we're almost always having a wine with at least two, three, four years of age. Um, so, Italy just, the wines just oxidize that much just fast. Like, two or three years, they're already getting orange. Um, where Tempranillo doesn't happen as fast. So, but yeah. Um, 
there's kind of this, I thought about the tar, but it's also it's like this kind of licorice, black spice. Um, yeah, licorice. Heard that today during, during tasting group. <clears throat> and I don't use that word a lot, but yeah, there's like a licorice component to it. That's, I need, a, I need to keep that in my vocabulary. Like a black licorice, not red licorice. Red licorice though, you get like with, with uh, Calipinos. You can get that. I don't use that. I don't use Twizzler, really. Um, you don't really, I don't really use that term very often. Yeah, this is delicious wine. 16 bucks. Heck to the yeah. Both are good values at $16. So it's a bit of green to it, like an herbaceousness to it. Let's do that again. It's like a minty, mintiness, a little pininess. Um, the tannin's really starting to build up too. It's a really good wine. Like this is wine, like 16 bucks. I'm like, yeah. I'm not saying this wine isn't worth, you know, isn't like, oh yeah, it's a good $16 buy wine, but there's just so much more going on with this. You're kind of like making that value judgment, but really good wines. So you should try the wine. If you find it, get it. I like it. Um, not that I could have afforded to go to Vin Italy this year, um, but it was canceled anyway. But th when I finally go to Vin Italy, I'm going to visit these guys and a bunch of other like other producers over there. But these guys are going to be first on the list. So yeah, you should buy these. You should buy these wines. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, the best way to help me out is to subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends about it. You can also hit the PayPal link in the description, send some ducats my way. Also, if you're interested in, in the equipment I use and maybe want to buy some of the same stuff, I have affiliate links for Amazon there. So check those out and uh, leave me some great ratings on iTunes um, or Podbean, which is where I host the podcast side of things. And we'll see everyone again next time.